okay, let's try and fit all of what's usually in your physics paper one on one A3 piece of paper here. So the topics we're looking at are energy, atoms or atomic structure, electricity and particles. Don't forget you can download the PDF version of this from scienceshorts.net, link in description. If you think there's any bits that I've missed, pop it in a comment down below and I'll add them to the mind map. Energy is not a thing that you can hold, it's something that objects and particles have. Energy is always conserved, it can't be destroyed or created just transferred. And we have different stores of energy, kinetic, gravitational or gravitational potential, electric potential. Now that's similar to electromagnetic, but usually electromagnetic is reserved for EM waves, which is a way of transferring energy. It's what we might call a pathway. I don't like that term, but some people use that. We've got nuclear, thermal, elastic potential, vibrational and chemical potential. And sound comes under vibrational. Work done is just a posh name for the energy transferred by a force. And here's the equation, W work done, or I like calling it E because, well, it's just energy, it's joules, is equal to FD. E equals FD, that's our first equation, force times distance. If you have something that drops from a certain height, then we know that the gravitational potential energy, or GPE, at the top is going to be equal to the kinetic energy at the bottom. That's assuming that there's no energy loss to the surroundings through, like, friction or air resistance. We'll talk about that in a second. We know that GPE is equal to MGH, mass times gravitational field strength, 9.81, times the height that it falls through. Kinetic energy is equal to half mv squared, where v is the speed in meters per second. So if it is an ideal situation, we can say mgh equals half mv squared, and you can see that the m's cancel. And so therefore, if you want to find out the speed that something hits the floor with, you don't actually need to know its mass at all. And you probably know that because things that are different masses will hit the floor at the same time at the same speed. They accelerate at the same rate. So what about if there is air resistance or friction or something like that? Well, the GP at the top, some of it or most of it is going to be turned into Ke, but we have energy that's lost. Sometimes you might be asked to find out how big the frictional forces are. And in this case, we say that the energy lost is equal to the work done against friction. And so we can say that's equal to FD, where F is the frictional forces. Be careful, D is not necessarily the height that it falls through. If it's on a ramp or something, it's going to be the distance down the ramp that it travels. Hooke's law is to do with springs, that's F equals KE. Force that a spring is pulled with is equal to stiffness or spring constant times extension. So this is a required practical as well. When you're describing it, make sure you say that you line up the zero mark on the ruler with the bottom of the spring. Make sure you have the ruler close to the spring with your eye in line. That's to reduce parallax error. Add 100 gram slotted mass, measure the extension, and then repeat to say 1000 grams. We draw a graph, force on the y-axis, extension on the x-axis, even though the force is the independent variable here. And the gradient gives you the spring constant. Don't overstretch either. Make sure that it goes back to its original length because if it doesn't, that means that the spring constant would have changed and you won't get a straight line in your graph. And we have an equation for the energy stored in the spring as well. Elastic potential energy is equal to half Ke squared. So a way of remembering it is that it's similar to the kinetic energy equation. Just make sure you get the right letters. Power is the rate of energy transfer. In other words, how many joules are being transferred per second. So you should be able to figure out what the equation is. It's power equals energy divided by time. You could say work done divided by time. It doesn't make a difference. So P equals E divided by T. The unit is watts, but like we said, that's the same as joules per second. Efficiency is how much of the input energy or power going into a transfer is used usefully. And pretty much it's impossible to get 100% efficiency with any energy transfer. So efficiency is equal to useful output power or energy divided by total input. And then we can leave it as a decimal or times it by 100 to turn it into a percentage. This is a Sankey diagram. You might see them, you might not. But the size of the arrows coming out show you what proportion of the input power is used usefully and how much is wasted. Energy sources, they are not the same thing as stores or types of energy. Of course, we have wind that uses kinetic energy, doesn't it? Solar that captures EM waves, tidal, again kinetic energy, hydroelectric, same. All of these are renewable. In other words, they can be replaced or replenished once they are used. On the other hand, we have some non-renewable sources, coal, oil, gas. They all use chemical potential energy to make heat. And we have nuclear, which of course uses nuclear energy to make heat. And then we make steam from water with this heat, which turns a turbine. Insulators is sometimes just for triple. We reduce heat transfer via conduction with an insulator. This is a practical. All we do is take identical cans or beakers we fill with water from a kettle. Each can will have different number of layers of insulation. What we do is pop the water in, then record how much the temperature drops over a certain time, say 10 minutes. The independent variable is the number 
number of layers, the dependent variable is the temperature decrease. Controls, quite a few here. Make sure that each layer has the same thickness. Make sure that the time is started at the same initial temperature. So say, wait until the temperature drops to 80 degrees, then start your stop clock. We're measuring the temperature with a thermometer. Same volume of water. We can measure that with a measuring cylinder. And we can make sure that we have the same room, same ambient temperature, so we don't have heat being lost at different rates. And of course, it's a good idea to put a lid on the beaker or cans to reduce heat loss due to convection. Okay, let's look at some atomic structure. Here's your bog standard atom. I'm just gonna draw helium, nice and simple. We have a nucleus in the middle that has protons and neutrons in. And then we have electrons around the outside. Protons have a charge of plus one. Neutrons are neutral, so they have a charge of zero. And electrons have a charge of minus one. We need all the pluses and minuses to balance out, so atoms are neutral, so therefore, we need to have the same number of electrons as protons. Okay, here's how we write the symbol for an atom or an element. We have the actual symbol itself for helium, it's HE. The bottom number is the number of protons. Yes, that's gonna be the same as the number of electrons as well, if it's an atom, as opposed to an ion. The top number is massive, so therefore it's the mass number. That's the number of protons plus the number of neutrons. And of course, to get the number of neutrons, just take one away from the other. Isotopes are the same element with a different mass. Iso means same. So we can have two different isotopes of helium. On the left, this is helium four. On the right, this is helium three. It has one fewer neutron in it. That shows you that it's the number of protons that determines what element it is. Okay, let's talk about ionizing radiation. Ionizing radiation comes from an unstable nucleus that decays not always the case. Now all EM, that's electromagnetic rays, apart from gamma, come from electrons. Now yes, it is possible for UV and X-rays to ionize atoms, but we say it's unlikely, especially compared to gamma. Here we're talking about the three types of radiation that come from the nucleus. First one is alpha, that is a helium nucleus. It's just what we've drawn before without the electrons. Because it doesn't have electrons, it's got a charge of plus two. It's very heavy, it has a lot of energy, so it can just barrel its way through atoms and just knock in electrons off atoms left, right, and center. It's highly ionizing. But because of that, it means that it's weakly penetrating. It gets stopped easily, and it can be stopped by a piece of paper or a few centimeters of air. We can use it in smoke detectors. If everything's good, then the detector will detect alpha particles, but if there's smoke, it will absorb the alpha particles, and that will then cause the alarm to be triggered. Here's an example of a decay equation for alpha decay. Let's take uranium-238. Now we draw an arrow going to the daughter nucleus the product that it makes plus an alpha particle that's four and two again just like helium and then from there it's just a matter of taking the numbers away 238 take away 4 92 take away 2 and that leaves us with 234 and 90 proton number of 90 is thorium so we've made a new atom beta or beta radiation it's just a fast moving electron therefore it has a charge of minus one it has medium ionizing and penetrating ability it's sort of middle of the road it's stopped by a few millimeters of aluminium here's an example of a decay equation carbon 13 be careful with the numbers for the beta particle the mass is basically zero so we put zero up the top and the proton number well it's an electron so we say it's minus one it's almost the opposite of a proton not really but we still write minus one and again it's just maths but just be careful the mass number doesn't change so it's 13 at the top but six goes to what and minus one well it's seven so therefore we've gone up an atom to nitrogen so that shows that a neutron is turning into a proton. So the mass stays the same, but the proton number goes up one. We can use beta to measure the thickness of materials, say in a paper mill. Gamma is special because, well, this is just when a nucleus has lots of energy left over and it just gives it out in the form of a gamma ray. So it's a high energy EM wave. So there's no decay equation because, well, the nucleus doesn't change in the process. And of course it has no charge. It's weakly ionizing, but it is highly penetrating. It's very difficult to stop. We can reduce it with lead and concrete, but we can't really stop it. Gamma we can use for a medical tracer or for sterilizing equipment. Radioactivity is how many decays happen every second in a sample of radioactive material. And that has the unit Becquerel. Or we can say it's how many bits of radiation we are detecting every second. We're not gonna detect every little bit of radiation that comes from a sample. So we don't use Becquerel, we say counts per second. It can be counts per minute or counts per hour as well. Don't forget, we must measure a background count first and then take that away from all of our readings after that. Because there is radiation that comes from lots of different sources like radon gas coming out of rocks and buildings and things like that, nuclear power stations, medical equipment, and also one I haven't written here, cosmic rays, that's a good one. When we have a lump of radioactive stuff, 
the radioactivity halves every half-life. So what will the activity have gone down to after three half-lives? We don't take the activity and divide by three. No, we have to half three times. So a half times a half times a half, that gives us an eighth. So after three half-lives, the activity has gone down to an eighth of its original value. So let's say the activity measured was eight counts per second originally. Now it's one after three half-lives. And if you have a graph of activity against time, we can find the half-life by just seeing what the original activity was, going halfway, and then seeing what time that is, according to the curve. And actually, you can use any point as your original activity. That's the good thing about half-life. So try and remember the question, how many half-lives? So you'll always be given questions which are like, the half-life is two days, what's the activity going to be 10 days later? So you need to ask yourself the question, how many half-lives? So if half-life is two days, but it's 10 days, then we have five half-lives. So we have to halve five times. Sometimes you'll be given a question where you actually have to go back in time. What was the activity 10 days ago? And in that case, you just double five times. Fission is what happens in nuclear reactors. What we do is have rods of heavy elements like uranium-235. And if you fire a neutron into it, it becomes so unstable that it splits in two. We're not too concerned about those, but we are concerned with the energy that comes out as a result and also the two or three neutrons that get made as well. Those two or three neutrons will then go on to cause fission in other uranium nuclei. And that's where our chain reaction comes from. That energy is then used to heat water to make steam turn a turbine. Here's fusion. Now fusion does happen. It happens in the sun so when you have light nuclei like hydrogen let's go with heavy hydrogen that's a proton and a neutron and if you have two of these that have high enough energy then they will smush together to make a helium nucleus and energy will be given out in the process now they've been trying for decades to make a reactor that uses fusion but they haven't managed it yet let's go on to electricity first thing about electricity is ohm's law Pretty much every question boils down to this. You're going to have to use V equals IR at some point. Voltage or PD is equal to current times resistance. What is V though? Well, it's voltage like we said, but the proper name is potential difference. That tells you how much energy a coulomb of charge loses or gains as it passes through something. So it's how many joules a coulomb loses or gains. Now a coulomb is a group of electrons. We don't deal with individual electrons because otherwise our numbers would be absolutely tiny, but we group them together into coulombs to make it easier. So we can therefore say that voltage or PD is equal to energy divided by charge, joules per coulomb. I is the letter we give to current, that is the rate of flow of charge. Any rate is something divided by time. So you should be able to figure out what the equation is. Current I is equal to charge divided by time, coulombs per second. R is resistance. We can say it's how hard it is for current to flow through a component. The unit is ohms. We give it the symbol omega, which is your little horseshoe. You have to know what the IV, that's current PD characteristic graphs look like for various components. The simplest one is for a resistor. We have a straight diagonal line that goes positive and negative, which shows that if you double the PD, you're gonna double the current. So the gradient does give you an idea of what the resistance is like at that point, but don't get confused. The gradient is not the resistance. If you wanna find the resistance, just take a point and then do V divided by I using Ohm's law. Here's what it looks like for an LDR, that's a light dependent resistor or a thermistor. Now, because it's a straight line, we know it's got a constant resistance. And so we say that that is ohmic. LDRs and thermistors are ohmic so long as the conditions stay the same. So let's take an LDR. If there's a lot of light or high intensity of light hitting it, then that means it has a low resistance. So that means we have a line with quite a high gradient. However, if we go dark, then it's actually harder for current to flow. So we have a high resistance. That means that we have a lower line. Thermistor is similar. It just works with heat instead of light. If it's hot, we have a low resistance. If it's cold, we have a high resistance. A diode is very unlikely that this will come up, but it's possible. It's a component that only lets current flow in one direction. So we can see that on the left-hand side for a negative PD, we have zero current, but all of a sudden we have a massive current once we go past a certain voltage in the right direction. A bulb or a lamp or a filament, well, it's just a piece of metal, really. It's definitely non-ohmic. Resistance does not stay the same. And we can see that from the graph. As we reach higher PDs, the current can't flow as easily. That's because the resistance is increasing. And we'll talk about why in a second. And this is a required practice. So this is the circuit that you would build. You just have a battery or cell or power supply with your component down the bottom here. I've just put a resistor in, but that's where you put your component. Then you'd have a variable resistor in the circuit as well to change the current. And 
and PD going through the component and we have a voltmeter across the component and an ammeter in line. Then you're going to increase the PD across the component by decreasing the resistance of the variable resistor. Don't forget to do negative PDs too by swapping the leads around on the battery. Here's another practical resistance of a length of wire. We have a power supply of some kind, then we have an ammeter in series with our wire. We have a voltmeter that can go across the whole circuit because, well, there's only one component in the circuit, that's the wire. We have what we call a flying lead that attaches to the wire with a crocodile clip so we can move that up and down and change the length of the wire that the current is flowing through. Don't make the length too short because the current can get so high that the wire could melt or it could injure you because it gets too hot. We want resistance this time, so we calculate resistance using Ohm's law, that's voltage PD divided by current. The independent variable is the length of wire, dependent variable is the resistance, the controls, use the same thickness of wire, use the same material, and not a control, but you've got to make sure that the wire is taut. So you get nice accurate measurements with your ruler. Again, have it nice and close, so we are reducing parallax error. And you should end up with a nice straight line, because resistance and length of wire should be proportional. So here's one of the resistance increases for a filament bulb. You should know from chemistry that metal is a lattice of ions surrounded by a sea of delocalized electrons. That just means they're free to move. So when you increase the PD, the current increases, but this makes the electrons collide with the ions in the metal more frequently. This then makes the ions vibrate more, that means the temperature increases, so that makes it even harder for the electrons to flow, so the resistance increases. Electrical power, we know power is rate of energy transferred, energy divided by time, but we can also calculate electrical power from current times voltage. It's unlikely you'll have to do this, but you might be asked to find power from the resistance of a component. In that case, we need to substitute Ohm's law in. We can either replace V, in that case we get I squared R, or replace I and we get V squared over R. If you have components in series, they must have the same current, but the total voltage, total PD is going to be shared. Parallel circuits is the opposite way around. They're gonna have the same voltage, same PD, but the current is shared. Now, when we have two components in series, we can call that a potential divider, just because, like we said, the potential is shared. In this case, the ratio of the resistances is equal to the ratio of the voltages across them. In other words, the bigger resistor will have the bigger share of voltage. So therefore, we can say that for two components, V1 over V2 equals R1 over R2, or V1 over the total V is equal to R1 over the total R. Of course, that works for V2 and R2 as well. We have to be very careful with electricity. It's pretty dangerous. So there are safety things that are built into electrical circuits. The earth wire is usually green and yellow. That's connected to the case of an appliance, especially if it's a metal case. So if something goes wrong, charge or current can escape through it to the ground instead of through the user when they touch it. A fuse is found in the plug and it's connected to the live wire. That's designed to melt at either three amps, five amps or 13 amps usually. RCD, that's a residual current device or a trip switch or a circuit breaker. They're designed to break the circuit if the current gets too high. Current is flowing through a solenoid and when the current gets too high, it makes an electromagnet and that pulls contacts apart in the circuit, breaking the circuit. These are good because they can be reset, whereas fuses have to be replaced. This is usually one for just triple people, static electricity in fields. If electrons are removed from an object, then it becomes positive and obviously vice versa. We can draw electric field lines to show the direction of the force a positive charge would feel. So here I have two plates that are charged positively and negatively. If there was a positive charge between them, of course it would be repelled from the positive plate and be attracted towards the negative plate. So therefore the field lines go down. That's what we call a uniform field because we have nice straight lines. But if we have something like a proton, we can draw field lines around it radially because we know a positive charge coming close to a proton would be repelled. And then obviously they'd be going towards something like an electron and for a field that isn't uniform if we have lines closer together that means the field is stronger at that point the national grid uses ac alternating current not dc direct current and we can draw two graphs to show what the voltage is doing for both we can see that ac wiggles that means the electrons are moving back and forth whereas for dc we have a constant voltage constant current so we just have a straight line and the national grid ac oscillates or wiggles at 50 hertz 50 times a second back and forth and the national grid has to use ac actually because it uses transformers transformers don't work with dc transformers are used to step up the voltage and that means step down the current before the electricity goes to the grid outside of a power station this is to reduce the power lost as heat due to the resistance of the wires, the overhead cables. And just outside your house, the voltage is stepped down again to 230 volts. 
Coming out of the power station, it's about 25 kilovolts, and then through the national grid, it's a few hundred kilovolts. Let's go on to particles. Density is how heavy a centimeter cubed or a meter cubed of a material is. It's how concentrated mass is in a material. Therefore, density equals mass divided by volume. This is a required prac. This is one they like asking questions about. If we have regular objects, that means ones whose volumes can be calculated by measurements. If it's a rectangular prism, just like a normal block, then we measure the three edges with a ruler or a caliper, and we find the volume by times in those together. However, if we have irregular objects, ones that you can't really measure with a ruler, what we do is use a displacement or a Eureka can. We fill it with water to where the spout is, then we put a beaker underneath the spout. We submerge the object using string. The volume of water collected in the beaker is gonna be equal to the volume of the object. And we use a measuring cylinder to measure the volume of water. Don't forget that you have to have your eye in line and we measure using the bottom of the meniscus, which is the bulge of the water. We can actually calculate the concentration of solutions as well. 100 centimeters cubed of water should have a mass of 100 grams. However, if the mass is bigger than this, then that means that it has something dissolved in it. So let's say that the mass ends up being 104 grams, that means we've got four grams of a solute like salt or sugar dissolved in it. And of course we can measure the mass of all of these things with the regular objects, the irregular objects and the solution by using a top pan balance. Don't forget to tear first. For solutions you must put the measuring cylinder on the balance first, tear it or zero it and then put the solution in. Internal energy, the definition is, it's the sum or total of the kinetic and potential energy of all the particles in a substance. If something gets hotter, that means the particles have a higher kinetic energy, they're moving faster. If we're breaking bonds, that means the potential energy has increased. Okay, let's talk about changing states. Here's a heating curve for water. We see we've got ice at the bottom underneath zero degrees Celsius, that's solid. Then we have liquid between zero and 100, and then gas above 100 degrees C. But we can see that we have flat lines when it's changing state. This is because the energy going in is not being used to raise the temperature of those points but actually break bonds to turn it into a liquid and then a gas. If we're talking in terms of internal energy, we're increasing the potential energy, not the kinetic energy of the particles. So if we're changing temperature, then we use the SHC or specific heat capacity equation. The energy that goes in or the heat is equal to the mass times the SHC times the change in temperature. We can say that's delta T. So we use those for the slanty bits, but for the flat bits, we're changing states. So that means that we need to use another equation. This is the specific latent heat equation. Heat goes in and that is equal to the mass times the SLH of the material. Different substances, different materials have different SHCs and SLHs. Of course, you know this from key stage three. Particles in a solid are close together. They're in a nice organized pattern. They could be in a lattice. They can't move, but they can vibrate. In a liquid, they're just as packed together, but they can move around. In a gas, however, the particles are far apart. They have lots of energy and they're flying around real fast. And we say that there's basically no potential energy there. It's all kinetic energy. There are three ways of transferring heat from one place to another. Conduction usually happens in solids. That's when vibrations are passed along. Convection happens in liquid and gases. We can say that's fluids generally. Hot fluids are less dense because the particles are further apart. So that means that hot liquids or hot gases will rise and then the colder liquid or gas will take its place. We can actually end up with a convection current. Radiation is the last one. This is infrared radiation. That's electromagnetic, isn't it? It's emitted and absorbed best by black matte materials. Pressure is how concentrated a force is when it pushes on something. So it's equal to force divided by area. We have pressure in a gas because the particles in the gas are colliding with the walls of the container. You can increase the pressure by adding more gas. That means that there are more particles. That means they're colliding more frequently with the walls. Similarly, we can make the container smaller. Again, makes them collide more frequently with the walls. Or we can heat the gas, giving the particles more kinetic energy. Again, that makes them collide more frequently. But more importantly, it makes them collide with the walls with a greater velocity. So that increases the force that they exert on the walls of the container. So that's pretty much it. If you think I've missed anything, put it in a comment down below and I'll add it for you. If you want to check out my flashcard question videos, then click on the cards and it'll take you to them. See you there.